Film Strip One, The Metis, a series of three film strips that examine the history, social development, and modern problems of Canada's Metis people. Produced by the Native Education Branch, Department of Education, Province of Manitoba. Frame 1. This is a group of Métis school children who are very proud of their culture and heritage. They are the descendants of a race of people which was born when the European white man began to intermarry with Indian women shortly after he set foot on the shores of North America. The Métis are neither white nor Indian. They are of mixed blood. Frame 2. The fur trade marked the beginning of the Métis race. As European traders penetrated the West to trade with the Indians for furs, many chose Indian women as mates. Frame 3. Such alliances were prompted not only by a desire for companionship. Indian women provided an important commercial link in the fur trade and their survival skills were invaluable to the European trader who was unfamiliar with his new environment. Frame 4. Their children were of mixed blood and mixed culture since they were exposed to the two different lifestyles of their parents. Frame 5. The early Métis or half-breeds developed various lifestyles. Some were employed by fur trading companies as clerks, interpreters, canoe men, and packers, establishing permanent homes close to fur trading posts. Some adopted a semi-settled lifestyle, devoting part of their time to farming, while the remainder was spent on annual buffalo hunts and commercial fighting, freighting with Red River carts. Others were totally nomadic, making their living as hunters and trappers, following the buffalo herds in summer and trapping during the winter. Frame 6. Many Métis became trappers since they found a ready market for their furs through the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company. Frame 7. The Métis adopted both European and Indian customs into a unique lifestyle of their own. For example, the Red River Jig was a combination of the intricate footwork of the Indian dances and the Scottish reels. The, the jig steps eventually became incorporated into square dances. Frame 8. The Métis used furs and hides to make European-style clothing that fitted to the body. Beadwork was commonly used for trimming. Frame 9. The dress of the Métis was characterized by the vividly colored sash which was made of brightly colored strands with arrowhead designs woven into them. Frame 10. Red River... The development of the Red River cart illustrates how the Métis adjusted European technology to the prairies. The cart was made entirely of wood and its various parts were bound together by wet rawhide which shrank and hardened after drying. This caused an unbearable screeching sound as the wooden wheels turned on the wooden axle. Frame 11. The Red River cart could be drawn by either horse, horses or oxen. Horses could travel 50 miles per day pulling 500 pounds while the slower but stronger oxen traveled 20 miles per day pulling 1,000 pounds. The cart became the key to commercialization since it allowed large quantities of pemmican to be transported hundreds of miles across the prairies. Frame 12. Many carts could be put under one driver's control so that cart trains were formed. A series of cart trails developed across the prairies that rivaled the rivers as transportation routes. Many modern highways are built on the old cart trails of the Métis freighters. Frame 13. The Métis became recognized as expert buffalo hunters. 
since buffalo hunting was a dangerous undertaking it demanded great skills in horsemanship. While riding through the stampeding herd, the buffalo hunter had to load his muzzle loader by pouring in powder, spitting in a lead ball, pounding the gun butt on his saddle to shake the ball into position, and aiming at the chosen buffalo. This procedure was repeated until enough buffalo were slain for the group's food supply. Frame 14. The buffalo hunter also faced the constant danger of being hit by stray bullets, gored by a buffalo horn, and thrown off his horse. Frame 15. Huge numbers of buffalo were killed in order to make a large amount of pemmican that was sold to the fur trading companies. The Métis turned buffalo hunting and the making of pemmican into a business. Frame 16. The Métis also gained a reputation as expert voyageurs and trip men. Larger, stronger canoes had to be built by the Métis since the birch bark canoes used by the Indians weren't strong enough to carry the large loads of freights needed in the fur trade. These larger canoes carried up to three tons of freight goods. Frame 17. When rapids or other rough water were encountered, the canoes and freight had to be portaged over land. Frame 18. As you can see, this was a very backbreaking process. Frame 19. Larger and sturdier craft were required for hauling freight from York Factory on the west shore of Hudson's Bay to Norway House on Lake Winnipeg and west to Fort Edmonton. The York boat was developed by a Métis named William Sinclair. It was an adaptation of a European whaling boat. Frame 20. When there was a wind, sails were used to power the boat. Frame 21. Since the York boat could not be paddled, it was either rowed, pulled, or lined through rough or shallow waters. Frame 22. Huge loads of freight could be carried in the York boat. Since these vessels were too heavy to portage like a canoe, the men had to drag them over portages by harnessing themselves to the load and pulling the tremendous weight. Frame 23. During the early 1800s, a trade war was waged between the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company, which both sought to control the rich fur trade. Frame 24. The Northwest Company failed to obtain a royal charter which would give it a trading monopoly on the Pacific, and it was unable to buy shares in its rival firm, the Hudson's Bay Company. Consequently, it resorted to violence. Raids were organized against the Hudson's Bay Company posts. Men were assaulted, furs stolen, boats wrecked, and loyal Indians threatened. Frame 25. It was during the height of this rivalry that Lord Selkirk and his settlers arrived at Red River. Frame 26. Lord Selkirk... As a major shareholder in the Hudson's Bay Company, Lord Selkirk was granted an area of 116,000 square miles of land in 1811 for the purpose of settlement. The area was named the District of Assiniboia. Frame 27. This map illustrates the area of Assiniboia and the route traveled by the Selkirk settlers. The first group arrived in 1812, followed by a new group in 1813. Both groups experienced a severe sh food shortage. Frame 28. Miles MacDonnell, the governor appointed by Selkirk, attempted to solve the food shortage. In January 1814, he issued a proclamation which prohibited the export of pemmican except by license from himself. 
In July 1814, he issued another pro proclamation which forbade the running of buffalo. Both of these actions posed a direct threat to the livelihood of the Métis and the Northwest Company. At this point, the Northwest Company decided to use the Métis as its weapon in opposition to the settlers. It wasn't difficult to convince the Métis that the Red River Valley was rightfully theirs, that they were in fact a distinct and separate people, a new nation, a nation invaded now by a foreign army disguised as settlers. Frame 29. The Northwest Company appointed Cuthbert Grant, one of its employees, as captain of the Métis. Grant believed that the cause of the Northwest Company and the Métis was one and the same. He began converting the Métis to a belief in a new nation, in which Métis rights could not be trampled upon by Magdanelle's proclamations. He led a systematic harassment of the colonists at Red River, causing Magdanelle to surrender. Frame 30. Robert Semple succeeded Magdanelle as governor in 1815. On June 19, 1816, when Cuthbert Grant was leading a group of 15 Métis to Frog Plain, north of the settlement, he was interrupted by Semple and 24 men at Seven Oaks. Frame 31. In the resulting skirmish, which has become known as the Battle of Seven Oaks, Semple and 20 of his men were killed while only two of Grant's men died. The Northwest Company held Grant responsible for Semple's death, and from this point on, realizing that the company had used him for its own purposes, his loyalties were confined to the Métis cause. Film strip two. Frame 1. Rivalry between the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company continued until 1821 when they finally amalgamated. Frame 2. This resulted in a surplus of employees and people were encouraged to settle at the permanent colony of Red River. Frame 3. Those Métis who held high rank in either company were given extensive land holdings and formed part of the colony's elite. Frames 4 and 5. Some of the large stone houses they built along the banks of the Red River still add grace and beauty to the Winnipeg area. Frame 6. Many of the Métis refused to move to the Red River Colony. Large numbers had settled at Grand Town, which is presently known as St. Francis Xavier, and whose landmark is the statue of a great white horse. It was from Grand Town that the famous buffalo hunts were organized under Cuthbert Grant, Warden of the Plains. As a permanent settlement, Grand Town became a model for other Métis people in terms of the value of developing small farms. Frame 7. The poetry and music of Pierre Falcon symbolized the unique lifestyle that the Métis developed in the Red River Valley. As minstrel of the Métis, he recorded every important occurrence in verse and song. Falcon Lake has been named in his honor. Frame 8. The millstones of Louis Riel Sr. on the grounds of the St. Boniface Museum commemorate him as Miller of the Seine. 
However, Riel was also involved in the movement for free trade to end the monopoly of the Hudson's Bay Company, which imposed restrictions on trading with the more competitive American market. In 1849, when Guillaume Sayé and two other Métis were tried for illegal trading, Riel led a group of armed Métis and surrounded the courthouse. Because of such resistance, the case was dismissed, thus signifying the beginning of free trade the end of the Hudson's Bay Company monopoly and a stronger belief among the Métis that they were in fact a new nation. Frame 9. The arrival of the SS Anson Northrop to the Red River Valley in 1859 was the first warning that steamships would soon affect the freighting business of the Métis on major waterways. Fame 10. By 1865, the population of the Red River District had reached uh, almost 10,000 inhabitants, the majority of which were Métis. The area was divided into parishes, and a study of this map will indicate the pattern of settlement. Frame 11. All of the lots fronted the rivers and streams so that each person would have easy access to the rivers, which were the main travel routes. Frame 12. The Red River settlement was only a small portion of the territory of Rupert's Land, which included all the land drained by rivers flowing into Hudson's Bay. This territory was held by charter to the Hudson's Bay Company from the British government. Canada wanted ownership of this territory and began to negotiate it to have it transferred. The people of Rupert's Land were not consulted and resulted and resented being sold like cattle. Frame 13. The, land, the Canadian government did not anticipate any difficulties and assumed that the transfer of Rupert's land was a certainty, so surveyors were sent out to begin dividing the land into square sections containing 640 acres each. This type of land survey was aimed at hastening settlement of the West. Frame 14. Fear that the river lots would be taken from them and furious that no guarantee of their right to self-government had been given. The Métis people formed a provisional government and asked Louis Riel to act as leader. Frame 15. The Métis took peaceful possession of Fort Garry. The provisional government ruled the settlement and planned for the future. Frame 16. The Métis decided to join with Canada, but only if certain conditions were met. The Métis drew up a list of rights, which was to form the basis of negotiations with Canada. Frame 17. The Canadian government sent out William McDougall to be Lieutenant Governor of the Western Region. He traveled by train via the United States and entered the west through Pembina south of the Red River Settlement. When he attempted to enter the Red River Settlement, Métis horsemen put up a barrier at the LaSalle River, stopped him and then escorted him back to the United States. In so doing, the Métis had made it clear that no authority would be tolerated until the list of rights had been negotiated. Frame 18. The Métis have erected a cairn at the spot where MacDougall was refused entry. It is situated at La Barriere Park in St. Norbert, just south of Winnipeg. Frame 19. Certain Canadians in the Red River settlement under the leadership of Dr. Schultz were opposed to the Métis and their insistence upon entering Canada as a province with full rights. One of them, Thomas Scott, was imprisoned for the insubordination and disloyalty. As a result of a court-martial, he was executed by a firing squad. 
This infuriated the Orange Lodges of Ontario, which were anti-Catholic and anti-French. They demanded that the Canadian Army intervene, capture Riel and hang him. The French Canadians of Quebec became pro-Riel and demanded that the Métis receive the rights enjoyed by all Canadians. Meanwhile, the list of rights had been negotiated and the Red River Settlement was to join Canada as a province with special land rights for the Métis. Frame 20. When the agreement was signed, the Canadian government sent out Colonel Wolseley and an army of regulars and militia to ensure that no violence would occur in the newly created province. Upon their arrival, the militia was disbanded. As a result, murder, rape, and pillage ensued. Many Métis, including Louis Riel, fled the new province to save their lives. Frame 21. The Manitoba Act of 1870 guaranteed the Métis their original river lots plus an additional 1,400,000 acres of land. This map indicates the area of the Red River Settlement and shows the amount of land set aside for the Métis. Unfortunate due to con unfortunately, due to considerable confusion on the part of the Canadian government, the land was not given out until 1878. Frame 22. Because of the delay in receiving the lands promised them and due to the influx of white settlers with negative attitudes toward them, many Métis left Manitoba in an attempt to begin life anew farther west. Large numbers settled along the banks of the South Saskatchewan River as indicated by this map. Frame 23. Some Métis followed the remnants of the buffalo herds and lived solely by hunting. Frame 24. Others hunted the buffalo but also established temporary settlements from which they trapped and fished when not buffalo hunting. Frame 25. In Manitoba, some of the Métis who remained played an important role in the rapidly developing province. One of these was James McKay, who became one of Manitoba's wealthiest and most influential men. Frame 26. He owned thousands of acres of land and built a famous Deer Lodge mansion as his home along the banks of the Assiniboine. As a huge man of 340 pounds, he became recognized for his great feats of physical strength. He was chosen interpreter in the negotiation of Indian treaties and was made a member of the executive council of the new province. Frame 27. Foreseeing the possible extinction of the buffalo, McKay captured and raised a thriving herd at Deer Lodge. From his original herd have come many of the buffalo in parks throughout North America today. Frame 28. Another successful Métis was John Norquay, the first and until now only native premier of the province. He played an important role in the protection of linguistic, religious, and educational rights of the French-speaking Métis. He also took a firm stand towards having the various racial groups represented in the government. An imposing building which houses government offices in downtown Winnipeg today is named the Norquay Building in honor of his contribution. Frame 29. Jerry Potts was representative of Métis who continued to live the old lifestyle in the Northwest. Having gained a reputation as a whiskey trader and Indian style warrior, Potts later became interpreter and chief scout for the Northwest Mounted Police, leading them to their first exploits in the West.
Film strip three, frame one. Many Métis became farmers and established permanent farming communities based upon the river lot system of land holding. However, the influx of settlers from eastern Canada continued. Once again, the Métis were fearful of losing their land. In 1883 and 1884, they began petitioning Ottawa to have their land claims guaranteed, but the government still ignored their requests. Frame 2. Gabriel Dumont, the gifted military leader of the Métis, was chosen to lead a four-man delegation to ride to Montana to seek the assistance of Louis Riel. Frame 3. Riel agreed to lead the Métis once again and returned to Saskatchewan where he established a provisional government with the hopes of seeking a peaceful solution to the land problems. Frame 4. Suspicious with the events that were taking place in the West, the Canadian government sent out troops to maintain peace. Under the command of General Middleton, the Canadian armies moved towards Batoche. Frame 5. The Northwest Mounted Police, led by Major Crozier, also marched towards the Métis settlements along the Saskatchewan River. However, they were confronted by Dumont and his men at Duck Lake and were forced to retreat. Frame 6. The Métis checked the advance of Middleton's army at Fish Creek. They proved that, given favorable conditions, buffalo guns could outshoot cannon. Frame 7. Faced by superior numbers that were equipped with rifles, cannon, and a Gatling gun, the Métis retreated to Batoche. Frame 8. From their rifle pits, the Métis were determined to make a last stand at Batoche. The Canadian Army was unable to penetrate the Métis lines. Finally, on May 7, 1885, Middleton planned to attack on several fronts at once. Middleton armed the steamship, the SS Northcott, with cannon and 55 soldiers and hoped to shell and then attack the Métis from the river. As the Northcott passed under a ferry cable, the Métis lowered the cable which disabled the smokestack and pilot house of the ship. Helpless, it drifted past Batoche and ran aground several miles past the scene of battle. Frame 10. The defenders of Batoche kept the Canadian soldiers at bay until the Métis had used all of their ammunition. When the soldiers made a desperate bayonet charge, the defenders had only stones to shoot from their shotguns. The Métis had been defeated. Those who were still alive fled to the surrounding hills. Frame 11. In a futile attempt to avert further suffering among his people, Louis Riel surrendered to the Canadian Army. Frame 12. He was imprisoned in the Northwest Mounted Police Barracks in Regina, awaiting trial. Frame 13. Riel was tried for treason, found guilty, and sentenced to be hanged. The sentence was carried on November 16, 1885. His execution cracked the imperfect mold of confederation and Canada was divided along the lines of race and religion. He had been called a madman and a murderer, a martyr and a messiah. He had shaken the government of Canada to its foundations and forced it to recognize the rights and privileges of the people of the Northwest. To French Canadians, he was a patriot and a prophet, the victim of bigotry and discrimination English Canada saw him as a would-be tyrant and traitor. Frame 14. Riel's body was transported to St. Boniface where he was buried in front of the Basilica. Frame 15. This monument marks the site of his grave today. 
frame 16. Defeated and disheartened, many of the Métis fled. While some went to the United States, many fled to the North, where they would try once again to establish their fam familiar lifestyles. Frame 17. Some set up camps in the bush and attempted to remain secluded from the influx of white settlers. Others joined their Indian blood brothers and lived with them on the reserves. Some moved to the areas of the prairie still unoccupied by settlers and hunted the few remaining buffalo, deer, and other wild game. Others attempted to establish businesses such as freighters and carters of goods to areas not served by the railroad. Frame 18. Many Métis became farmers, but since they lacked the necessary knowledge and equipment, success was gained only by a few. Those who were unsuccessful became nomads, wandering with their families across the countryside doing odd jobs for the settlers. Frame 19. Large numbers found peace and respite from discrimination by establishing settlements in the north where the land was unsuitable for farming and thus free of white settlers. Frame 20. Today the Métis can be found in every province and territory in Canada. A close study of this map will indicate the estimated Métis population which is distributed across Canada. It should also be noted that the largest populations of Métis people are still concentrated along the river and prairie cart routes where their ancestors first appeared. Frame 21. In recent years, many Métis people have moved from rural areas to large urban centers to seek employment. Frame 22. However, since many lack education and do not possess mar marketable skills, they are forced to make a living as unskilled laborers, earning the minimum wage and occupying housing in the poorest areas. Frames 23 to 25, they are faced with the basic problems of poverty and social rejection. Frame 26, in response to the problems of Indian and Métis people in the cities, institutions known as friendship centers have developed which serve as places where people can socialize with friends as well as receive information about jobs housing, legal aid, and emergency help. They also organize recreational and cultural activities in addition to assisting special groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous. Frame 27. In the late 1960s, Native organizations such as the Manitoba Métis Federation were formed to reflect and meet the needs of the Métis people and to assist them in developing themselves and their communities. The Federation is firmly committed to programs which will provide greater cultural, educational, and economic opportunities for all Métis people. Frame 28. As time passes and with further education and organization, the Métis people will achieve an even stronger place among Canada's many races. Frames 29 to 32. The province of Manitoba has honored its founder, Louis Riel, by erecting a monument across its legislative buildings which symbolizes the agony of his struggles as the Métis moved towards social and economic equality with other Canadians, Louis Riel remains as an inspiration to them.